All right, welcome one and all. I'm David Greenberg, and it's such a pleasure to have you here. And it's definitely been a little while since I've gotten on camera and recorded a video. So I'm feeling very good. I'm feeling enthusiastic. Um, a lot of changes have happened since my last video. Uh, changes in my own life. I'm going to share a little bit about this. This is not really the video where I'm going to go into kind of a lot of what's been going on with me, but I will mention that I am recording today in this uh, beautiful Airbnb in Austin, Texas. And so that's one of the biggest changes is that I have started traveling again and um, I am here in Austin. I'll be in the New York City area in the beginning of March and then there'll be some other travel announcements coming up. So I'm super stoked about that. It's great to be in this environment. And as always, I've created a very powerful and important presentation for you today. My presentation today is called, It's All a Big Distraction, The Occulting of Objective Morality. And well, just like all my presentations, I think this is really important. If you're brand new to my work, you're probably going to find it useful and beneficial to go back and maybe watch some of my previous presentations first. You don't have to do that, but it could add some more context. The other thing is I want to mention briefly that uh, what I'm going to share today is not quote unquote, my truth. That's a nonsense term. Truth is always objective. However, it is true that I, you or I or anyone can only discern truth from our unique vantage point, from our perspective. So what I'm gonna be sharing with you today, of course, is the truth as I understand it from my particular perspective. Uh, I have done a lot of research on this. this is, these are areas and topics that I dive into um, as a researcher and an educator. So I believe that I have done it justice in, in providing you with valid information, but only you can come to determine what's true for you. So uh, I just invite you to take in this information and, and then run it through the trivium to figure out if it's true or not uh, based on your discernment. Um, if you are brand new to my work, which I know some of you might be, just by way of a brief introduction, uh, I am an animist, uh, an occultist, I am a multimedia artist and a content creator, hence this content. I'm also an educator and I'm also a coach and a consultant. So I, I do business coaching and consulting. I work with a few select clients very closely and um, I'll talk a little more about that, uh, maybe not on today's video, but in context, I'll share more about what's been going on in terms of the business work that I do. But on this platform, which is freedomvibe.art, that's the website, we talk. We tend to talk about natural law, objective morality, which is gonna be a big topic for today, the occult sciences, hermeticism, spirituality, psychology, health, wellness, and nutrition, wealth and abundance, and of course, freedom. So if one or more of these topics resonates with you, if these are topics that you deem to be important and valuable, and you want to gain new knowledge and new insights related to that, then I want to welcome you. You're right. You're in the right place. Okay. And, uh, my presentations tend to be at a fairly high level. What that means is I assume that you are essentially an adult in your thinking. I assume that you're not just gonna run away from something just because it seems new or scary, that you're not gonna, sh you know, your mind's not gonna shut down uh, just because you're exposed to ideas that could challenge the way you're nor you're, you've been thinking about things. So that's what I mean when I treat you like an adult. So uh, if you're someone that is easily offended uh, or can't handle, you know, new knowledge that, that contradicts what you already believe, this probably isn't the place for you and I want to invite you to gracefully exit or not gracefully, whatever your desire is. But if you are a, an open-minded person who is highly teachable, then I think you're going to get a lot of value from this. Okay, 
So to get to kind of get us started here, to get us in the mood a little bit, I'd love to do something that I started doing on pretty much all of my recent presentations, which is I've gone and curated a few quotations that I feel really bring out the spirit and essence of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I find these are this, these are really a, a great thought provoking way to kind of get us started. So let's start with the first quote. It's discouraging to think how many people are shocked by honesty and how few by deceit. Noel Coward. Yeah, I think that's really sums up uh, a large degree of just even from my own interactions with people. I see this coming out that People are shocked, and I would say offended uh, by honesty and truth, just to kind of extend that. And it's like they have the blinders on, like they just can't see all the deceit, even though we are essentially swimming in it. You know, we're, we're drowning in it in today's society, if we're just, if we're being honest. So I think that to a large extent sums up the ethos of the day. The hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in times of great moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. Dante Alighieri. So true. So true. We, we, you know, at first blush, we think that being neutral is a good thing stay out of the conflict, be neutral, right? It's, it's come to be associated with being essentially a virtue. But is that really the true? When there is evil and wrongdoing being conducted right in front of you, is it really the right thing to remain neutral? So I, I just want to invite you to contemplate that. I've already decided for myself what I think about that. Um, and I think this quote really uh, summarizes my understanding of it. But just check in with yourself and see, you know, what you think about it. Another super powerful and highly relevant quote for the times that we're living in. Most of the evil in this world is done by people with good intentions. T.S. Eliot. Wow, talk about a punch right in the face of those who claim to be good. We're surrounded by them, folks. And unfortunately, even I, because this is the, the you know the way that we've you know we we've, we've all been brought up in, in in a society that has that cultivates certain ways of thinking. So even I in the past was not able to escape this. We think we're doing the right thing because we have good intentions. But ultimately, it is evil. And as we get into this presentation, we will I will explain why that is. And of course, if you are if you've already watched some of my other presentations, you'll know what I'm referring to. But if this is brand new to you, this might be um, this may provoke an aha moment for you. OK, so now I have a question for you. Have you ever given some thought and kind of wondered or kind of scratched your head about why there are so many distractions in our modern society? Why is there so much flash and glitter and noise and constant barrage of information, propaganda, 24 hour news, new news bulletins around the clock? giant spectacular sports events with huge flashy halftime presentations sporting events not just in the United States of America where I'm from but all around the world huge concerts um, talk shows galore reality TV shows it goes on and on and on. Celebrity interviews. It's kind of nonstop. 
And it's like the more you get into the big city, you know, think of New York City, Times Square, for example, places like that. It's like the intensity increases so much that it's overwhelming. And the only reason that you kind of even can just deal with it is because you've become accustomed to it. But if you were to take someone who's like a country, you know, born and raised in the country, you know, village, maybe a handful of people living there, and they were to suddenly find themselves in, in the midst of all this, they would be overwhelmed by the sheer barrage of stimulation. So what's this all about? Is this natural? Is this really you know, is this is this just naturally the way it is? You know, what's up with this? I think about it all the time. I don't know about you. Maybe you haven't thought about it. But it is something that I personally have given a lot of thought to. Here's another question. This is a little bit deeper, thinking a little bit deeper. Does the design of our society, and our society definitely has a design, I've talked about this you know, quite extensively in other videos, it's not just an accident, but does the design, the gradual, you know, which has obviously developed over a long period of time, does this really reflect our true nature as human beings? Is this really a reflection of who we truly are? And just in case you're curious about the nature of human beings, I did do a presentation last year called Understanding Human Nature. And I want to invite you to go watch that presentation because I feel like um, as a complement to what we're talking about today, that could be very helpful. So you may want to explore that top topic further if it resonates with you to really understand the true nature of who we are and um, basically how we operate as human beings. So another way to ask kind of what I'm asking is, is this really the best that we can do? Is this really the best that we can do? That's a question I asked on my short artistic video, The Key to Unlock the Prison. So you may want to check that one out as well. Um, that video is kind of related to the topic I'm talking about today, but in a very short format. So when I look around the world, to me, the answer is a, is a clear and resounding no. This is definitely not the best that we can do. But I had to explore these topics extensively in order to come to that conclusion. I had to really take a close look. I had to learn how to respect, respect, to look again, not to respect what? To respect myself and to respect the nature of reality. So what is going to be the inevitable outcome of a society that becomes everly increasingly, ever increasingly distracted? In other words, as the distractions grow and grow and grow and grow, and we just become more and more distracted as a society, as, as a civilization, what is the consequence of that? See, we do, we live in a world where there are consequences. We live in a world where there are causes and there are effects. So when more and more people become distracted, then there is going to be a consequence to that on, in terms of the whole of, of the shared reality that we experience together. So my question to you, and for us to contemplate today together is what is that inevitable outcome? What does that look like? What naturally flows from that? What, what almost has to happen as a result of that incessant distraction, right? And we're going to ask deeper questions as well, like why the distraction? But just consider for a minute that there is a consequence and consider what that consequence might be. Now, who has the power to make a change? Let's say that, that we agree that this is not healthy, this is not good, that we're so distracted. There's something more important that we should be paying attention to and that we should potentially 
wean ourselves off of being so distracted and so easily, uh, you know, misdirected or, or you look over here, like kind of that redirection. So the question is, in terms of a, of a civilization, in terms of a species, all of us together, who has the power to change that? Let's say we agree that that's a noble outcome, but things are continuing the way they are with a lot of momentum, right? Things have a lot of momentum. It, it's not likely to all of a sudden change between today and tomorrow. So who really has the power to make a change if assuming that we agree that we would want to make a change? See, distraction is redirection. Distraction is redirection and redirection means that there's an intention behind it. There is someone or some force, some conscious force or being or more than one being that wants you to look over here instead of over there. That's the redirection, right? And this is similar to the magician. The magician is a great example because the magician very clearly and very intentionally wants to redirect your attention over here while he does something over here that you that, that causes you to think that he did something magic, like he didn't actually do what he did, which is, for example, extracting a card from his uh, sleeve or whatever the trick entailed. Right? He didn't want you to see what actually happened. So that's the redirection. So it's all very intentional. It's not just, it didn't just happen. It's, it happened for a reason. Now, in terms of what we're seeing in society, there is so much distraction, so much distraction, so much distraction. Now, if that's redirection, the question, of course, is redirection from what? What is so damn important? What is so crucial, what knowledge, what understanding is so valuable that a certain group of people would be so hell-bent on distracting pretty much everyone, most people, the vast majority of people, just to keep them from learning whatever that truth is. What could be so important that would warrant so much distraction? Now, I discovered something very important and very valuable through the course of my study, through the course of being open-minded and being willing to ask these questions and not just accepting what I had been told. And it's, it's something that took me a while to figure this out. It didn't just fall into my lap, but I was able to discover this. And that was that as hard as it is to believe, all these distractions, the ones I that we've been talking about, all the, you know, civilization wide, you know, all the big sporting events and the concerts and the celebrity gossip and the reality TV shows and all of it and the 24 hour news, it's all distractions to really keep you from learning just one important thing i mean does that blow your mind or what it's all a distraction from one thing and when when you when i reveal to you what i've learned you may again it may all click for you and you may experience a lot of emotions around it including strong emotions around having been deceived about something so basic, so fundamental, so foundational. And, you know, I wouldn't blame you if you got angry. You should, or, or if you experienced some kind of sadness for, for mourning the loss of what you could have experienced in life had you known this earlier in your life. So I get that. So as we go into this, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, there is a, a, a mourning there is an, a strong emotion associated with this for many people. And I experienced that too. And I was very angry in the beginning. And uh, that came across, I think, more in the videos that I created closer to the time that I, I discovered this. 
I think that came across a lot more. I've since gone deeper and deeper into this. And so I've created more balance and I've uh, forgiven myself and, and healed to a large extent. But I just want to, you know, be straight up with you. If this is the first time you're hearing this, this could be, you know, quite shocking depending on how receptive you are to it. So just, just be prepared for that. The truth that all these distractions is trying to hide from you is singular. It's one truth. It's the truth about objective morality and what has often been called natural law. In, to put it another way, that morality is objective, meaning the difference between right and wrong is not subjective, it is objective. And the uh, consequences of either acting right or wrong are actually built into reality. They, they exist naturally. They are not man-made constructs. This is the one singular truth that all the distractions and all the redirection and all the, hey, look over here and fill your head with nonsense and irrelevant material and trivia and all that, that's why all of that exists. To keep you from seeing the clear truth of objective morality. And it's likely that you and many people have been so programmed about the, even the word morality that when I use that word, it just, you gravitate, you just like lump it together with religion. Oh, it's, he's talking about religion. Now, oh no, I liked David's content until now, but now he's starting to preach. <laughs> like, I know I'm going to lose people here because that that binding between morality and, and religion has been so tightly wound that people can't get it into their head that this is not a religious concept it has nothing to do with religion at all not even a little bit in fact many times i'm not necessarily saying in every single case but many times religious doctrines actually have the same effect they they distract you with irrelevant things that are not have nothing to do with morality and uh and then you and you become jaded right and it, it also creates a polarity so then people polarize to for example atheism where there is no meaning to anything you know nihilism atheism existentialism so there's kind of this extracting out and everybody's missing the point. Had nothing to do with religion from day one. There is zero requirement to be a religious person in order to be a moral person. Or even to understand what it means to be a moral person. So this is the first big hurdle that we have to overcome is the negative association with that word morality that, oh, it's got to be religion. Nope, it does not. And it is not definitively so if you're struggling with that you know that's going to be where you are going to have to do the work that's going to be for you personally to overcome this whatever's whatever you perceptions you have about morality and we're going to talk about what morality is objectively we're going to give the precise definition so that it's all super clear you know we're not going to leave anything we're not going to leave this presentation with things being kind of wishy-washy or oh it's he didn't explain this clearly no it's all going to be explained in a second but we need to uncouple morality from religion because if you listen to religion you're going to believe that nonsense notions for example that it's immoral just to to be greedy to want to accumulate a lot of wealth that's not immorality the way in which you acquire what you do does have to do with morality and the actions that you take yes we'll talk about that but just the desire or even to be proud of yourself i'm talking of course about the so-called seven deadly sins um and you know this is not these are not immoral behaviors and they don't even have to necessarily lead to immoral behaviors right many religious traditions believe that if a man if two men want to have sexual intimacy or to women, then that's immoral. Again, has 
nothing to do with what is objectively moral. You may find it distasteful, right? You may find it even disgusting. You may, you may be turned off by certain behaviors, but that doesn't mean it's immoral. There is a specific definition of morality that we're going to get into. So we really, you know, if you're, if you're stuck at this point and you're really having trouble uncoupling morality from religion, then I, I strongly encourage you. Well, first of all, stick with me because we're going to talk, we're going to talk this through together, but just be aware of that, that for you, that could be the big challenge, right? And I know it's going to be a huge challenge for a lot of people. Because I know for a fact that a lot of people have gravitated towards religion because they feel like that's the way to be a good person. And for them, it may be in part, but it's not required. And someone can be a completely good and moral person and understand all of the things that I'm talking about here and beyond and not be religious. Like me, I am not a religious person. I do not align to any religious doctrine. I do not follow any particular dogma. Um, I draw eclectically from different traditions, including some that people might consider to even be in opposition to each other, although I don't see it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could talk a lot about this because it is, it is a sticky point. So suffice it to say that morality, objectively defined, is not a religious concept. And really, ultimately, it has nothing to do with religion. Okay, cool. So we've kind of leaned into talking a little bit about what morality is not. So let's talk more about what it is. So it's actually very simple. In a way, I, I kind of almost have to laugh or chuckle a little bit every time I talk about this on video because it's so simple. And in a way, I'm kind of also laughing at myself for not getting this in the past. So I'm not just laughing at you or some at other people for not getting it. I, I get it. I get the fact that we've been distracted and I get the fact that, um, you know, this is this knowledge has been largely occulted. So I totally understand that. But objective morality is basically all it means is that the difference between acting right and wrong or right and wrong behavior is built into reality. It's not something, it's not just a mental construct. It's not just an idea or a philosophy or an, even, an, even worse, an ideology. It is actually something that is built into reality. In other words, reality tends to reorganize itself in a way things tend to manifest in a way along the lines of how we act and behave. So in other words, there are certain consequences based on our, on the morality of our behavior in the aggregate. Again, most of what we experience is in the aggregate because we share this reality together. That's, that's something that, again, I, I almost have to laugh sometimes that I have to emphasize that this is true. Some, there, there are literally people out there who don't get, who, who in their mind, uh, they think that it's all in their mind. Like there isn't, there isn't an objective reality. That's called solipsism, by the way. I've talked about that. Um, there are people who, and I want you to just grasp for a minute how dangerous it is to live in a world where there are a lot of people who think this way. Because if they literally think it's all in their head and reality is just organizing for their personal benefits, like it's all happening for their benefit, what do you think that's going to, how do you think that's going to inform the way they behave with respect to you and other people, right? Do you see why that's not a good thing? Okay. But we can discover this, that, that morality simply means that the difference between right and wrong is built into reality. And if we can just understand it and understand it and then modify our behavior accordingly in a certain way that we'll talk about, then all of a sudden great things start to happen. I mean, we, we experience a much better outcome with less suffering, um, less difficulties, less, less challenges, and more freedom, right? That's the whole point. The whole point is in order to be more free, we have to understand the operating conditions of reality. It's, 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 it's so simple. 
And yet there's all this distraction so that nobody pays attention to this very simple inform knowledge and you know, much less educating about it. It's also important to note, since we're narrowing down the definition and trying to, you know, trying to bring this into a clear understanding, is that morality only applies to the behavior of individuals. And so the, to the behavior of individuals. So it doesn't apply to your thoughts. It doesn't apply to your feelings. We've all had thoughts of doing things that we know are wrong. You know, there's no, I'm not putting forth the idea that there's some kind of thought police. That's nonsense. Don't think of a purple elephant. Don't think of a purple elephant. I'm telling you, stop thinking of a purple elephant. You see what I mean? Like there's a certain extent where you're not going to be able to avoid thinking certain thoughts. That's not where morality is defined. It's in your behaviors, right? Your feelings. It's incorrect to think that somehow you can stop yourself from feeling. Feelings are, re are an emotional, it's the energy of what's happening around you passing through you in a certain way to inform you about the nature of the experience. If you feel angry, it's not, it's, you can't stop yourself from feeling angry. That anger arose naturally as a response to what you perceived as an injustice. Make sense? Sadness, you felt a loss of some kind, for example. These are natural feelings. Feelings, all feelings are natural. It's what we do with them that can pervert them in some way or take them, take us off the path. But morality has nothing to do with the way you, with your inner world, with how you think and feel. Nope. It only applies to the behavior of individuals, of individuals. So when we talk about rights, you know, the topic of rights and human rights is very closely related to this in the proper context. There, the notion that there are rights, collective rights or rights of a group of people is nonsense. Absolute rubbish. Right and wrong occurs at the level of the individual. You as an individual, I as an individual, we can either act rightly or wrongly. It's really that simple. And, when, and we get to make the choice because we have free will. Again, human nature, we have free will. It's up to us to make the choice and then to face the inevitable consequences for ourselves and for everyone together in this shared reality. So here's the big bombshell. Here, here's the consequence. So remember in the beginning of the presentation, I asked you what's going to be the consequence when there's so much distraction and people are distracted from learning what is really important. What's going to be the consequence of that? Well, one of those consequences, and this can be easily validated by, for example, conducting a, a social experiment, doing a relatively small but reasonable size sampling of people and asking them questions. You can, you can come to the conclusion very easily. And that is the following. Most people, more than half, probably close to two thirds based on the, no the numbers that I've seen, most people think and believe that morality is subjective. They get to decide what's right or wrong. They get to make it up, whatever they, if, if they think it's right, it's right. If they think it's wrong in their own mind, it's wrong. Or in some ways, and this is similar, but maybe even worse, They've convinced themselves that there's a small group of people in the world. We can call them the government or the ruling class or whatever you want to call them, that they are the ones who get to decide what's right or wrong and everybody else has to obey, but it's still subjective. It's just whether it's subjective in their own mind or subjective relative to what other people think, the people who are the most, perhaps the most, uh, power hungry or whatever dynamic you want to look at. So this is the consequence that just, just think, I want you to think and feel into the, the deeper truth and the deeper problem that I'm pointing out to you here. Try to really grasp this because it's so 
crucial. I want you to really wrap your head around it. I want to invite you to do that. Most people in the world, so on the one hand, morality is objective. It's not something we get to make up and we're going to dive in deeper into what morality is to really lay that out. But on the one hand, you have the fact that morality is objective, but then you have the majority of people thinking that it's not. What do you think that's going to create? What kind of reality does that create? That kind of dissonance? Do you think there's going to be a consequence to that? Or do you think that's just going to just be like the water flowing over, flowing under the bridge? No big deal. What do you think? What do you think is going to be the, what do you think are some of the potential consequences to that? Really give it some thought. Just, just imagine for a minute that you live in a world and you might be one of these people, but the fact that you're watching this video at least indicates that you are at least willing to consider that you may have been wrong about it. So that, that already puts you on a stronger footing, but just imagine you live in a world where most people think that right and wrong is whatever we want it to be, whatever, whatever the hell we want to do we can get away with it or if we think it's the right thing no matter how many people we have to trample no matter how many rights we have to trample over or, or destroy no matter how many people lose their lives as a consequence we get to decide just imagine that mindset really really grasp that what what that mindset represents so what do you think have already been the consequences of this and even until now like let's not even talk about what's going to happen next because we can certainly do that but just looking back at what it, everything that's happened up until now and i realize that you know we we live relatively short lives in terms of the trajectory of all of history so our scope of perspective is somewhat limited in that way i i totally get that but just from looking at it so let's just talk this through so if morality if we can agree that morality is objective the difference between right and wrong is objective and if we can agree that the reality is going to deliver consequences based on the choice we made collectively because we live in a shared reality what do you think have been some of the consequences that have happened up until now as a result of most people basically either not understanding or not even believing in morality or thinking that morality is whatever they think it is. What do you think the consequence of this has been? Just contemplate that. So in order to really better grasp what has happened and what is going on, let's finally give a clear definition of what morality actually is. Let's just get right into it, right? And again, this is something that I've talked about multiple times on my other content. So if you're not new to my work, you probably already know this. But if you are brand new, this is really for people who have never, you know, you may have never heard it explained in such concise terms. So that I'm really doing this for your benefit. I want to just kind of give you the textbook clear cut definition that you'll be able to discern immediately that it's true because it'll resonate as true. That, that's the thing about truth. Like, um, I'm sharing this knowledge with you, but you're going to know whether it's true or not because you're going to have an intuition around it, right? So you're going to hear, you're going to see the, the reason behind it and also the intuition. So you're going to know immediately if I'm giving you the truth or if I'm uh, bullshitting you. So, um, but this is the objective definition of morality is. And the good, the good news about morality is it's really only three things. Like most truths, it's very simple, it's very elegant, and it's even beautiful. So truth and beauty are very closely aligned. This is something that we discover as we start to dive into knowledge is that, that what is true is often very beautiful and simple and elegant. What is co overly complicated and has many layers of complexity and is kind of overwhelming, that's not really what is true. It's, it's just a fabrication, okay? So having that in mind, 
what are the three things that comprise morality? Well, number one, it starts with accepting responsibility. You, to be moral, the first step is you basically look at yourself in the mirror and you say, I am responsible. I am responsible for the consequences of what I do. If I say something or do something wrong, even by mistake, because we all commit mistakes, of course, we are not perfect. Nobody is perfect, obviously. I think we've, we've all discovered that already. Um, but the bottom line is whatever we do, we accept responsibility for the outcome, right? So if, if something that we do causes some harm, even if we didn't intend to, we still accept responsibility. That is the foundation of morality. Without this, there is no understanding, understanding of morality. There is no incorporation of it. There is no conscience because true conscience, this is conscience. Conscience is the inner knowing of right from wrong. Having a conscience, right? So it's all foundational. It's all very simple. I'm responsible for me. I'm always responsible. I can never delegate that responsibility. I can never shirk it. I can never, in fact, you know, get rid of it. No matter, even if I think I can, even if I claim that I can, even if I claim that somebody can be responsible for me, I can't do it, right? Parents, when children are immature and they haven't fully developed in terms of their intellect or their, you know, their intelligence coming online, parents will naturally act as stewards to protect the child from the consequences of their behavior because the child, even though the child behavior does have consequences they don't they haven't necessarily fully incorporated that into their um they haven't fully been educated to fully grasp that you know and that just could be because their consciousness is still coming online but the child is still responsible it's just the parent is shielding the child from the um, inevitable consequences and also teaching the child how to behave in a moral way so but child adult any age we are all responsible, right? And it's accepting that responsibility and recognizing it. That's the key. That's what I'm talking about. Number two, don't harm or take advantage of others. Don't steal their property. Don't coerce them. Don't deceive them. Don't take wrongfully that which does not belong to you. In some ways, all all wrongdoing is a form of theft. Mark Passio has talked about this extensively and very eloquently in his own work. And he talks about what he calls the seven true deadly sins. So they are murder, which is the theft of someone's life. Assault, which is the theft of someone's well-being in their body and the right to be safe. Um, rape, which is the theft of someone's free will to decide with whom to associate sexually, with who, to whom to share intimacy. Theft of property, which is basically just theft of physical property. Trespassing, trespassing, which is theft of someone's uh, right to be safe in their private abode. Coercion, which is the theft of someone's right to decide how they wish to act as long as they are not harming other people and deception, which is the theft of the knowledge required to make the right choice, misleading people so that they don't make the right choice. So all these things are forms of theft and they are forms of theft of some kind of property. So all rights are property rights. So the second tenet of morality, which has also been called the non-aggression principle or the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression, is don't harm, don't cause harm, don't harm others, don't take advantage of them, don't steal their shit, don't do bad things to other people, right? It's really that simple. And we all know intuitively what that means, but we can explain it out. So that's the second pillar of what it means to be objectively moral. And then the third one, this one is so neglected in modern society is you got to defend yourself. It's the mirror. It's the flip side of that. It's also been called the sacred masculine principle 
of self-defense. You have a moral duty. It's not even just a right. You have a right, of course, but you have a moral duty to defend yourself if someone or something tries to harm you, which can happen and does happen. And not just you, but you could also protect, help to protect and defend those around you. That's also very noble. Family members, vulnerable people, but also anyone around you if you know people can protect each other. Okay, people can help each other to be, to defend themselves better by training in martial arts, for example, or how to carry a weapon, or how to wield a weapon, whether it be a firearm or some other kind of weapon, or even just their own body as a weapon, which is what a lot of the martial arts is. So you have a moral duty to protect the integrity of your being against threats. So that is the third aspect of morality. So it's you're responsible for your actions, don't cause harm to others, and defend yourself by any means necessary. Okay, let me just harp on that last point because people don't get this. There's a reason why in English and many languages, there are two words. There's kill, to kill, and to murder. They are not the same thing. I'm not sure why people struggle with this so much. There's a reason why there's two different words because they are completely different concepts. To murder is to wrongfully steal someone's life. Someone's walking down the street and someone else comes along and, and, and takes their life for no reason. They weren't provoking them. They weren't doing anything. They were just walking along. Or, or they had a reason, but of course it's an immoral reason because they wanted to steal their property, for example or they just didn't like the way they looked, okay? Some bullshit excuse. That is murder. You wrongfully, or that person wrongfully stole the other life. Now, if you are the person who's walking along and someone comes along and tries to attack you, and you will naturally, as it is your right and your moral duty, you will defend yourself. Now, in the course of defending yourself, if their attack is particularly vicious, you will have to defend yourself in a particularly vicious way that could lead to the other person who attacked you losing their life. In other words, you may kill them in the process. If that happens, or when that happens, you did not commit murder. It was never murder, no matter when, how many times it happened in the past. It is not murder now, and it will never be murder in the future. If you kill someone who came and attacked you and would not stop attacking you despite whatever you tried to do to stop them. If, if the only way that you could stop them was to kill them, that was not murder. Okay? And yet, again, going back to this idea of the religious thinking and, you know, ways that people think wrongly, you know, there's still a lot of people who think that if you took someone's life, even when you were defending yourself, that somehow you murdered them. No, you didn't. It doesn't mean that there isn't a consequence and that doesn't mean that, that we don't have to deal with the consequences of that, right? Even accidents happen, but we still need to attempt to make, you know, to rectify in the best way possible. And of course, to avoid that. But if someone came and tried to attack you and the only way you could stop them was to kill them, that's not murder. Okay, let's just be super definitively crystal clear straight up about that. No, no wishy-washy language, no confusion because there is so much confusion about that. And that confusion is leading to a lot of suffering in the world. So you as a sovereign being, you rule yourself because you accept your responsibility for all your behaviors. You're not gonna harm others and you're gonna defend yourself, right? So you have, you know, you have a moral duty that, you know, if you're not willing to defend yourself, then you're not truly being moral because that is one third of, of what is considered to be moral, okay? So those are the three aspects of objective morality. Okay, so now 
hopefully we're pretty clear on what morality is. It's not something super crazy, woo-woo or mystical, something that's hard to grasp, that takes even takes a lifetime to figure out. It's so simple and elegant and straightforward what it is. And we all and we know, I mean, when I sh when I shared with you what morality is, even if you had never heard it explained that way, probably if your intuition was is, is well connected, it probably just all made sense. You know, and maybe it maybe even just brought you back to something that you already knew or you knew deep inside and it just came to the surface. So we can agree that it's all super straightforward. So the next question, which is essentially going back to the core of what we're talking about today is why is the is this so important and simple truth? Why is it occulted? Occulted simply means hidden. Why is it hidden by way of all the distractions and all the dis all the redirection to non-important stuff to other things, including to to uh, thoughts and belief systems that are essentially the opposite. So why is it why is it occulted? Uh, there's a famous Latin expression, quo bono, who benefits? Who gains a benefit from objective morality being occulted? So I want you to, you know, before we get it and continue, give that some thought. Why do you think, who do you think can benefit from this and why and how? It's the psychopaths and the narcissists, the people who essentially have no conscience or have little to no conscience because there is a little bit of a continuum, right? And if we put those groups of people together, psychopaths and narcissists, we're talking probably somewhere around 15 to 20 percent of the population of, of human beings. If you're talking pure psychopaths, like people who are born psychopaths, that's probably a much smaller number, maybe just 1% of the population, maybe one, between 1% one and 2%. But if you include the narcissist people on this continuum, you really could be talking up to a fifth of the population, right? And that's a massive number. And because they have no conscience, for them, morality is whatever suits them, right? Because they literally, inside their being, they cannot comprehend why they should not harm someone else if, if they can benefit from it. Like it literally doesn't compute in their mind, in their mentation, right? So for them, it, for them, for psychopaths and narcissists, it is natural to believe and to think that morality is whatever they want it to be, that there is no objective morality, right? Do you see, see how that makes sense from their perspective? And then what they essentially are doing to kind of, I may be getting a little ahead of myself here, but essentially what they are doing is they are giving most of humanity their mindset. They are transferring their belief about morality onto everyone else, onto all of us. And they're fashioning and thereby because they understand that we live in a mental universe and that there are consequences. If they can get everybody to think that way, do that they're basically the world is created in the way that they want it to be, right? Basically a hell planet where they get to rule. They wield power through what I call manufactured authority. Manufactured authority. It's not true authority, which is the laws of creation, the way, the operating conditions of reality that we cannot escape, that's true authority because we cannot, as long as we're in this reality, we can't escape them. We can try to, you know, the psychopaths, they try to work around that. They try, they try to get, you know, get everything in their favor. And the way they do that is they put a layer on top of natural law and it's basically their manufactured authority. So that's, we're talking government, we're talking the military, um, we're talking the police and other institutions of what, what I and others have called order followers. Basically, these are people who will just, they'll just obey. They'll do what they're told because they're getting paid, mostly because they're getting paid, but they may, it may also be for other motivations. Now, that's a topic that I've explored in from different angles, it's including specifically looking at government 
from kind of an, an occult and esoteric perspective. So if you want to explore that topic further, I want to invite you to go check out a presentation I made last year called The True Meaning and Purpose of Government. It's a very powerful treatise. We kind of break down the word government and we discover a powerful allegorical spiritual teaching within the word itself. So that could be a great deep dive exercise if you want to kind of explore what we're talking about today from a different angle, but still pointing back to the same truth, the same inherent truth and foundation, then I invite you to go check out that presentation. So now that we understand and fully understand what, what morality is and what's the difference between right and wrong, it's pretty obvious that all government is immoral. And the reason why is because it's all based on deception and coercion that is often backed by physical violence and theft. OK, so it's all based on deception, meaning, you know, convincing people that you have to follow all these rules and essentially coercing them under the threat of violence. That's where the police come in and the law, you know, the court system and judges and attorneys and the, the whole legal judicial system. There's different layers to it, of course. It's not just one thing, but essentially it's all a big deception. It's all a big coercion game. And then if it comes down to it, it's not necessarily going to happen every time. But when it comes down to it, if there's a conflict, there can actually be physical violence. People can have their uh, freedom stolen from them. They can be thrown into a cage. What is called basically uh, what is euphemistically be called a prison or a jail, what's actually just throwing into people into a cage like they're animals or stealing their property, whether it's their money or even stealing something that belongs to them, their, their house, their, their, uh, whatever they, uh, whatever their property is. Right. So government on its face is completely immoral, completely immoral. And uh, it always has been and it always will be. But it can only government has so much power because in part, I'm not saying it's the only causal factor, but one of the factors is because people simply do not either do not understand morality objectively or as we've discussed, they simply don't believe that that is what morality is. They think that it's that it is that people do have a right to rule over other people and that some people do get to decide what the rules are and enforce them. So that is the reason why a government, despite being completely immoral, continues as an institution. So going back to what we talked about earlier, we can see the consequences of ignoring or denying morality. And that is basically an increasingly totalitarian civilization, an increasingly hunger games society, an increasing society with more surveillance, more control, more police, more rules and regulations, more ways that you can be arrested um, and imprisoned uh, or fined or whatever it is, just more and more and more restrictions. OK, and it's just on this trajectory of increasing and uh, even to the point where, for example, Four years ago, I can't believe it's been uh, almost four years now, um, people were wrongfully uh, made to stay in their homes across the whole world because of a, of a virus that, uh, you know, a threat that was essentially just a, a slightly more threatening than a flu virus. OK, so, yes, you know, maybe a slightly, a slightly higher level of threat, not an order of magnitude. And yet somehow everybody was coerced into staying at home, even at the risk of, you know, losing their job, losing their business, um, losing their way of creating a livelihood and so forth. And, and people were actually, in, you know, helping to enforce this peer enforcement. Right. So just increasing, increasing, increasing control. And basically a complete erosion or an increasing erosion of freedom. So freedom is the real sacrifice. OK, so that sounds a little bit doom and gloom. And if you have followed my work, you know that I'm definitely not about I'm, I'm not a black pill guy. Um, I do not think that it's all 
doom and gloom. I'm definitely not a nihilist or, you know, some bullshit like that um, or an existentialist. So I can tell you that 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 there is a solution. There is a solution. We can get out of this. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that like we can just press a button and all of a sudden it all starts to get better in one in 24 hours. I mean, technically that could happen, but the likelihood of that happening is pretty low. So I want to focus on more of a realistic approach. And, and that's why I'm talking to you right now, because you are actually part of the solution. OK, and that's what we're going to talk about. So the big question is. Knowing that there's been a consequence to not, you know, to not understanding, knowing that there's been a distraction to keep us away from the simple truth that morality is objective and there is a consequence for, for such action. And that has led to essentially institutionalized violence in this world. So the institutions of this world are based on violence. So what's the solution to us? How do we get out of this mess? How do we start to extricate ourselves, right? And again, you're probably going to have a lot of different feelings about this, and I, I don't blame you. And you may feel angry, sad, frustrated, all kinds of emotions. That's fine. Feel those emotions. Don't deny them. But what is ultimately the solution? How do we get ourselves out of this mess? The solution, just like the problem, is singular. The truth is always so elegant, so beautiful. All we have to do, all you have to do to do your part is to bring objective morality back into the realm of where it belongs in common sense. That's just, we all know it because we do. Because again, unless you were born a psychopath, literally born without a conscience, and there are, there are a few, a certain number of people that that happens, maybe around 1% of the human population. But that's, that still leaves the other 99% of us who have a conscience, right? So that's the, that ain't no big thing as long as we do fully understand the truth. So all we have to do is just go back to basics, go back to morality, teaching morality, um, recon, first of all, recognizing the truth of it, implementing it in our own lives, and then teaching it. So that's, that's what I call common sense. So... It's common sense in a way, uh, what would be any, another example of common sense? I mean, you don't put your hand on a hot stove if you don't want to burn your hand. Common sense. You know, in a way, you almost don't have to be taught that because if you start putting your hand close to the stove, if it's hot enough, you're going to pull it away. So it's common sense. So we want objective morality to be the same thing. It's just, we all know it. It's common sense. It's obvious, right? We. I shouldn't even have to do a video like this. The only reason I have to do videos like this is because because of all this distraction of what is essentially intuitively true, right? It's something that we already know is true. So this is the solution to bring this back into the realm of common, dis common sense and discourse, right? So talking about it openly, unabashedly, creating more content about it. It can't just be me creating videos about this. You have to do the same thing. Obviously, teaching morality to our children. I don't personally have children, but I'm saying collectively for those for you, if you have children or for those of us who do, um, to all the children, we should be teaching morality as much as we're teaching arithmetic, uh, physics, any other of the, you know, grammar, any of the other common liberal arts, you know, morality, and from a very young age. Whoops, I skipped ahead there. So we got to start. It, it's part of the education, right? Imagine how different the world would be if every child was taught morality. Every child was taught to be responsible for their behaviors, to not harm others, and to defend themselves in such simple terms. Imagine, just imagine how amazing the reality would become as a result of that, you know? And if you're struggling to imagine that, I mean, I feel sorry for you in a way, but that's also a testament to just how beaten down the human spirit has become. That literally our imagination has been beaten down to the fact where we can't even, you know, we collectively as a whole 
I'm not necessarily saying that that's you or me, but we can't even see the simple truth of it and how beautiful it is, right? Truth is beauty and beauty is truth. So teach it to the children. So what's your role in this? I'm already doing what I can. That's why I create these videos. I could be off, you know, hiking in the mountains or, you know, go to a party. I mean, I do these things, of course. I enjoy life. I enjoy all the things in life. I, I enjoy everything that I do. But what I'm saying is, you know, it, instead of spending, you know, half of my Saturday afternoon getting on here saying things that should be that should be obvious per common sense and intuition and, and basic intelligence and having to explain things that really should just be so straightforward. Um, I'm doing that because I know that it needs to be done. It's the right thing to do, right? It's, it's my contribution to helping improve things. So you, your role in this is, is the same. You need to do, you know, from your own unique perspective, you need to, well, first of all, this one is so, so important. You've got to acknowledge that you've been deceived. You've got to admit that you were, you've been had, you've been duped, you've been conned, you've been clowned. Just admit it. You know, it's a tough pill to swallow. You gotta, you gotta look at yourself in the mirror and say, I was taken for a ride. I was completely deceived. I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Got to admit it. Just, you got to admit it, and you have to accept responsibility for whatever you did under the wrong, based on the wrong information, based on bad data. Garbage in, garbage out, as we say in the world of computer science. You got bad data coming in, so you probably did at least a few things that caused harm. It's just, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. I did. I know I did. And basically, since I've started to awaken to the greater truth, I've taken a lot of action to modify my behaviors so that now I'm very careful not to cross over that line consciously. So, but it's, it starts with that first recognition you were had. You just got to admit it, right? I was taken, I was conned, you know, just like, just as though you were conned by an individual, like a con man or woman, except it happened on a much greater scale. And that's kind of what makes it, uh, that's kind of what provokes maybe more of an angry uh, or, you know, enraged response for some people is just recognizing how, how much they were taken for a ride. But for there to be true healing, you've got to admit that. You've got to, you've got to just, you know, you've got to own that. And then based on that, and based on now understanding the truth, you can move beyond that. So here's the beautiful thing. When you ironically or paradoxically, because this reality is full of paradoxes, when you actually admit openly to having been essentially victimized or been deceived, you actually stop being the victim in that moment because you own that shit. You own the fact that you were had. And, but then you draw a line and you say, up until this point and no further. This is the end of the line. I will no longer be deceived. Yes, I was deceived. Yes, I was taken advantage of. Yes, I, I bought into incorrect beliefs I bought into incorrect even ideologies I have to admit I probably caused some harm maybe even a lot of harm as a result of what I did under those wrong assumptions but you know what that's all done we've turned a chapter this is a new chapter this is a new version of me this version of me knows this information I can't unknow it. It's like taking the red pill in the matrix. I can't unknow it. And now I'm no longer the victim because I'm empowered, because I am responsible, because I'm gonna not harm others, and I'm gonna stand up for myself. 
those three things, right? I'm gonna do whatever I need to, to stand up for myself and my integrity, including my integrity to act in the right way. So you stop being the victim. How, how amazing is that? How amazing is that? I mean, isn't that the shit? Isn't that great? We can celebrate. And we should celebrate. And I want to celebrate with you. I, I mean, I would literally want us to celebrate this. Um, but in order to do that, more of us need to do this, right? It can't just be you and me and a handful of people, okay? But here's a deeper truth that I want you to contemplate. I want to invite you to think about this too. Morality, acting morally, is very closely related to self-respect and essentially love of self. So when you truly, truly love and respect yourself on a deep level, in the true sense, not in a narcissistic, like ego-driven, look at me, I'm the greatest kind of, you know, kind of inflated way of looking at it, but like the true love, loving yourself just like the love of creation, you know, what some people call the love of God. When you truly have that self-respect and you're willing to take a look at yourself, then you, in some ways you cannot not act morally, right? It, it, it naturally flows from that. A self-respecting person, for example, when you, when you truly love and respect yourself, you take responsibility for what you do, right? Why would you not if you truly loved and respected yourself? Because you know that you're the one doing the actions. So why would you not take responsibility? When you truly love and respect yourself, you do not want to harm others because you see yourself in others. You see others in you. You see that we are all connected and you simply want others. To, you want the same thing for others that you want for yourself. It's just a natural thing. And you stand up for yourself. You're not going to take shit from nobody. No one's going to tread on you. No one's taking your rights, not without a fight. As I like to say, over my dead body, you're going to take away my rights. So that's self-respect. I respect myself enough to stand up for myself. Right? So you can see that these things are closely, closely related. The more you truly love and respect yourself, the more moral you are naturally. In some ways, without even thinking too much about it, it just flows naturally from that state of, of being. And your actions do matter. They do matter. They do make a difference. So commit right now to making better decisions from this point forward. Commit to making better decisions with respect to the choices that you make in life. Okay, recognize that there is a consequence and recognize that you, that you cannot, you can control your actions, but once you act, once you do take that action, you're not going to be able to control the consequences because those are built into reality. That's the natural law in effect. That is the, the objective nature of morality, the mirror aspect that reality is going to give back to you consequences so you learn that when you act a certain way, you get a certain outcome. If you act a different way, you get a different outcome, right? So start, so commit to making better choices, better decisions. And then as you go through this process, when the time is right, I'm not saying you necessarily have to do this from the first day, but start to add your voice as I have to the voices of, to the chorus of truth so that we can sing together. We can sing the truth and speak it aloud together and more voices. There's enough voices in the lie. Remember, the distraction is tremendous. Look at how much look at how much they've perfected it. Again, go back to what we talked about in the beginning of the presentation. They've got the lie down like a machine. Pumping it out, pumping the lie out 24/7, 24/7, you know. All those things that we talked about. To drown that out, we need to speak, have more voices, which means more than half of us need to be speaking the truth. That's the number, 51% or more. It's, it ain't gonna, nothing significant is gonna happen until we reach that tipping point. Sorry, bad news. If you think it can happen, if you think 
a great awakening can happen with like 10% of the population. Eh. Survey says, eh. incorrect. The only time it's going to happen is when 51% of all human beings in the world know, understand and understand objective morality. They implement it in their own lives as individuals, and then they continually share what they know is true out into the world. They add that voice of truth. So that's what you got to do, right? But you first got to implement it in your own life. That's why the, this is why this step comes after the step of looking within. So if, if you need more help with this, um, I do work with people privately on a one-on-one -on -one basis, on a very limited basis. It's not and it's not, I'm not looking to bring in like a bunch of people to work with me. That's not how I operate. Um, but if you're an individual, maybe you've been following my work, maybe you've been working on yourself and you're like, okay, I've gotten up to a certain point, and I, but I, I'm still stuck with something. I, I want to go to the next level. Okay. I do work with a few people on a very limited basis. So if it resonates, reach out, you can have a conversation and just see if there's a fit. Um, just be aware that I respect myself and I respect my time. So when people work with me, there is going to be an investment. There's going to be a financial investment. There's going to be a time commitment and there's going to be a, an accountability commitment, meaning you're going to commit to taking certain actions and holding essentially being held accountable and holding yourself accountable to certain things that you're going to do. So just be aware of that. It's not for everyone. It's not for you. That's totally cool. That's why I create all these free public facing videos, because for most people, I, I just want to give as much knowledge as I can and help you to move along your path as much as possible. But if it does resonate, feel to reach out. My email is, uh, you know, in the uh, or you can go to the website, freedomvibe.art. You could or you could just go to the, um, go, you know, send me an email, which is in the description. Okay, so I appreciate you very much. Um, all this content, I basically self fund this. This is not a business. Freedom by Better Art is not a business. It's essentially an, an unincorporated private enterprise, um, not motivated specifically for profit, but just motivated to grow and share this kind of knowledge. So, um, I, like I said, I fund this myself for the most part. I do occasionally get some donations and sponsorships. So, if you want to, um, consider being a donor or a sponsor. There are some links below the video. Go check them out. I appreciate you. But as always, give this video a super thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Share it with everyone you know. Comment below the video anything that you want to comment and subscribe to the channel depending on where you're watching this. Thank you so much and I will speak to you very soon. Take care.